Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give our attention again to God's words through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, uh, let's start with a, with a story to, to help us illustrate what God is talking about here so that we can take it to heart. A man and woman get married. And within a few months, their dream comes true. They're going to have a baby. And, and, and they love that baby with all their heart, even though all they know about him is that little tiny plus side on the test. This boy is going to get nothing but the best. Their, their one-bedroom walk-up isn't going to cut it, so they cash out their savings, and, and they buy the, the best one-acre parcel in the town's best school district, and they start building. It's amazing what they're able to accomplish in less, than, in less than nine months. It's not just a palace. This is a home where they're going to show their love to their boy. And, and they put the finishing touch on the front door just when she goes into labor and they head out for the hospital. It's a sign on the front door that says, love lives here. And then when, when mom and, and baby come home from the hospital hel- healthy and happy, it's great. But it doesn't last. They, they teach him from the very beginning the, the purpose of, of the house and everything in it. That it's not just a big pretty box full of stuff. It's, it's a way that they provide for their needs. It's a place that facilitates family. So, so the problem isn't that, that they haven't taught him or that, that, that the, the structure itself doesn't, doesn't witness enough to their love. He witnesses it every time he walks through the door and and brushes past mom and dad on his way to his bedroom. He witnesses it whenever his friends come over and he regales them with stories about how overbearing and dim-witted mom and dad are. The problem is that he wants everything they give him but them. And he thinks about how wonderful it would be if mom and dad would just leave him alone. And, and mom and dad, they, they know how he feels and, and what he says, and it breaks their hearts. It's like everything that they gave him backfired. He loves the gifts, but not the givers. He wants toys, not a family. Hopefully that that helps us to to understand so that we can take to heart what God God describes here. When I read, especially the first half of this passage, uh, what what comes to mind is is the image of of the, the, the militant atheist type PhD who studies the the interwoven complexities of our, of our infinite universe, and, and he just ignores the fingerprints of an infinite, eternal God that are plastered all over that. God says, God says they claim to be wise, and, and in many regards, they're incredibly smart, but still God calls them fools because they see 
what's obvious, and they ignore it. And there's no excuse for that. But while that, that militant atheist type is certainly among the people that God describes here, the, the group he's talking about is larger than that. He doesn't say that these people deny the existence of God, does he? He says they, they suppress the truth and deny the truth about God. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. So, so you read through it, and by the, by the end of that second paragraph, the, the image of the militant atheist with a PhD in a, a lab coat, it transforms into ancient superstitious folk who bow down to statues. And if, we have a, if we're having any trouble figuring out how those two groups go together, God reveals it in the very last verse. They all exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. They're all like that boy who loved everything about his home except his parents. These people embrace the gifts and they either ignore or despise the giver of the gifts. And, and whenever that happens, whenever that happens, I don't want you, I just want your stuff. The gift becomes the God. False gods. Don't just picture golden calves and stone statues. Anything. Anything that we take and put in the place where only God belongs, anything that, that we look to for things that only God can give, if we think that's where my life is, that's what I need for, for happiness and joy and security and fulfillment and peace, that's an idol. And it happens to all of us. It's exchanging the truth about God for a lie, and it's worshiping and serving created things rather than the Creator. And if, and if that weren't bad enough, whenever that happens, even more bad things follow. God says of, of such idolaters, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Idolatry dehumanizes you. Your mind becomes enslaved to the object of your worship. Just to use probably the most obvious example in our society. If you worship money, if money is, is what you look to, to, to fill your, your every good, and, and that's where you go for your, for your refuge in trouble. If that's where you think your life is, is, and you imagine that your happiness and joy and your safety and your fulfillment and peace come from that, then what happens, what happens when it disappears? Or when there's not enough? Or when you have a problem that dollar bills can't solve? If it's your God, it smothers you. It smothers you. And, and you get angry or scared or despondent or, or some other state of despair that you can't climb out of because then you realize it, that your God won't save you. And none of this is a surprise to us, is it? You don't even need to be a Christian to realize this. There was um, a, a postmodern um, author who was very ambivalent about religion uh, who made the following observation in a, in a college commencement address in 2005. He told the graduates, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or other spiritual type thing to worship 
is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you, you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Worship your body and beauty, and you will always feel ugly. He realized the problem, at least in a, in a superficial way, how we look to control things that, that we can't control. And in reality, they control us and, and drive us to self-inflicted misery when they don't give us what we imagine they will. But his words fall a little short. They don't, they don't expose the depth of the problem. That, that the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. It's not just that, that people are destroying the, themselves with false gods. It's that they're turning their back on their only hope. Don't picture this, this, this wrath as, as God shooting down fireballs from heaven, like the, the boy who, who throws rocks at his classmates because they won't play with him. Well, if you, don't be my, if you won't be my friend, I'll show you. Now picture this more like the like the boy who wants everything but his parents. They're not angry because they've stopped loving him. They're angry precisely because they do. And after years of warnings falling on deaf ears, their, their only option is, is to, to let him go and give him what he wants and let him hit rock bottom. Maybe then he'll see the light. To summarize verses 22 to 24, they, they traded in God for images, so finally God let them go and gave them what they wanted. He handed them over to their desires. And maybe now they'll see their need for him and, and see how he fills their every need before it's too late and all that's left is wrath. I know that I'm not addressing this sermon to unbelievers. I heard what we confessed together before the sermon. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, we believe in, in one Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. But do you know yourself well enough to understand why we can't afford to skip over this passage? We believe, but we still fall into idolatry. We still put things where only God belongs and imagine that that's where my life is, that that's what we need for happiness and joy and safety and contentment and peace. And when we do, we follow after such things, and God fades away in the rearview mirror. So think of this passage, think of this passage like the, like the police, police flashers in the rearview mirror. They, they wake us up. They, 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 they let us reflect and examine ourselves and, and confess. And they lead us to, to, to actually to thank God, to thank God for the times that, that he's shown us the futility of those things that we've worshipped that can't save us, to thank him for the times that he's shown us the futility of money, how, how there's never enough, even when we're up to our ears in it, how things like, like jobs and health and family and friends that we love and trust, how they just disappear in a moment. And then we can, 
And then we can look up and we can look forward with a, with a renewed commitment to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. From now on, I'm going to do a better job of believing. Uh, no, no more of this half-hearted Christianity stuff. But that's actually not the solution, is it? No, 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 no. We don't, we don't look up from our sin and, and look up then to ourselves and our renewed commitment. Really, that's just shifting from one idol to another, from one thing that can't save us to another. We look up from our sin at the real God. At the real God. Who, who didn't stop at showing his love for us in, in all of his creation and all his physical gifts. The real God who also entered our creation to save us from our idolatry. You just confess this too. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. For us, for us, and for our salvation came down from heaven and became fully human for our sake for our sake was crucified under Pontius Pilate suffered death and was buried that's the real God he didn't just create the universe to show his love he died for you, to bring you forever back to the one from which you've wandered. The wrath of God is being revealed against the godlessness and wickedness of people. But God took that godlessness and wickedness and put it on Jesus. And that's where his wrath went to. We look up from our sin at the God who took it away. And that's the real God. And he really did die for you. And he really is what you need for every good. And he really is your refuge in every trouble. That really is where your life is and where your happiness and joy and, and, and safety and contentment and peace are. Everything else comes and goes. Everything else disappoints. But the real God, he holds you in his hand and he gives you what you need day by day the one who died for you isn't about to leave you. And he doesn't wait for your trust to rise up to him. Obey the first commandment, then I'll start giving. He brings his promise down to you. That's the antidote for idolatry. He gives you something real for your faith to hold on to, and then he strengthens your faith to hold on to it. He comes in, down into your heart with his love and forgiveness and faithfulness and takes their place. Amen.